Bible, open it to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And really what we've been doing, as you well know, we've been going through the great text of the Bible. And uh, today we come to 1 Corinthians 13 and really probably the most used or most read chapter in all the Bible, perhaps except Psalms 23. You know, reflecting back, I've, I've probably done 300 weddings or so, and I would bet at least 280 of them, some part of 1 Corinthians 13 was used. I'm just curious, some of you can't remember exactly when you got married, but some of you here can. How many used 1 Corinthians 13 at some portion in your wedding ceremony? Well, some of you may not be married then, because yeah, yeah. Well, you didn't get to hear this chapter preached. I'm, I'm, conf, I'm confident even if it was used as a reading in your wedding, but today we're going to unpack the truth, and I pray that God would speak to your heart. It is called the love chapter, rightfully so. Actually, the King James Bible doesn't use the word love, but it uses the word charity. But the 19th century called and wanted its word back, and so now we're using the word, rightfully so, this great love of God. It's not surprising that the Apostle Paul would want to speak to the, the, the church at Corinth about love, real love, because they had a skewed idea of what love was. And the, as is, even in our culture today, this misunderstanding between the difference between love and lust, and, and certainly in, in Corinth, uh, the, the, this was a cosmopolitan city. Was, it was really pagan to the core. You remember they had a temple of Apollo there, but also a temple of uh, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and fertility. And so the way that those pagans would worship would be to travel to the, this temple of Aphrodite where a thousand temple prostitutes hung out and part of their expression of worship was having sex with these temple prostitutes. Probably not too hard to get a crowd if that's the way you worship this pagan god. But to call someone a Corinthian was to imply that they were sexually immoral. They were morally bankrupt. And here in chapter 13, Paul unveils a prescription for this paganism and this warped idea about love. Because you see, really, love can be the panacea for all of our lives. It's the answer for the pain in your life, the predicaments in your life, the problems in your life, the pettiness in your life. If you will let love win out, then I'm telling you, love can transform your life. It's the solution to your situation. It's the resolved and strained relationships. It's the answers to your anguish, and it's living a life of love. Love is the core competency of Christianity. I read an article online recently called the chemistry, <clears throat> excuse me, the chemistry of love, and it said scientists are discovering that romance is biological. Well, at one time, a fruitless or frivolous study now has become a scientific quest. We all believe romantic love was in a person's head. And since recorded civilization, there's been always been stories of romantic love. But now there seems to be a change of thinking about love from a scientific community. That love is really an involuntary response that our bodies make. It's bred in the physiologically DNA of who we are. It used to be thought that romantic love was really a Western civilization kind of thing, a cultural phenomenon. But a study done at Tulane University of 166 cultures, 147 of them showed clear evidence of romantic love as we know it here. Listen, here's what I know. It may start in your head, but it soon makes its way into your heart. Amen? I fell in love with Mary Dighton when I was 16 years old. It took her a whole lot longer. <laughs> but if there's a principle to be learned, persistency pays off. <laughs> it's the greatest decision I've made, ever made in my life, save giving my heart to Jesus Christ the day we got married. My life would be incomplete without her. Her life would be a whole lot easier without me, but not mine. Romantic love is certainly not the emphasis in this great chapter. This is a chapter on divine love, God's love, available through faith in Jesus Christ. I can assure you today, every marriage that is breaking up and headed for the divorce court could be healed if this application 
of unconditional sacrificial love would be applied. All the bitterness, anger, and strife would quickly dissolve. Every conflict, unresolved issue, and every church could be reconciled. And all relationships could be stronger and resilient through love. Love is the banner that flies over every one of our lives. And I submit to you the greatest need this morning is not in money, success, a better job, or an extended vacation, but it is for you to learn to love like God loves you. You see, as card-carrying evangelicals, we have an obligation, a clear mandate. Since we've been given this great love by God, He expects us to love as well. And so I'm going to read today eight verses out of 1 Corinthians 13. It's a wonderful chapter, of course. You stand out of reading God's Word. Then we'll just unpack these verses real quick. Stay with me and see if we can learn some things about God's love and how it is affect, uh, affects our life as well. I speak in the tongue of men and angels, have not love. I'm only resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, and if I have faith that I can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames and do not love, I gain nothing, for love is patient. It's kind. It doesn't envy. It doesn't boast. It's not proud. It does not dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It keeps no records of wrongs. Love doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with truth. It always protects, always trusts, it always hopes. It always perseveres, for love never fails. Where there's prophecies, they will cease. Where there's tongues, they will be stilled, and where there's knowledge, it will pass away. And then these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Father, I pray today, for filling of your Holy Spirit, I pray that I could speak the things that are in this text. I pray that I wouldn't misinterpret or speak anything that wouldn't bring you glory and honor. I pray that we could learn to love better, to forgive quicker, that you would guide our lives and teach us how we can choose and make the right decision volitionally to love other people. So God, help us to understand more clearly the love that we've come to know in Christ our Lord. In his name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Three quick things. If you want to follow along in your worship bulletin there, I want to talk first about the preeminence of love, the preeminence of love. Do you realize 547 times you will find this word love used in the Bible? Now in our text today, chapter 13 obviously is preceded by chapter 12 and chapter 14 follows it as well. And you know what those chapters are about? Really it's an expose on spiritual gifts. And Paul is saying, but I want to show you a more excellent way. And then he lists four things that are desirable to possess Eloquent speech, he says, prophetic giftedness, incredible faith, and a gracious heart. But he said all of these things are insignificant compared to the need we have to learn to love in a right way. You know, in the English language, we have one word for love, and it's love. It's not that way in the Greek language. Four words are interpreted love. But I would say that word love in the English language is probably the most overused word that, that is out there because having just one word if, if we're talking about what we love we, we love pizza we love, our, uh, love some product we love our sports team we love the person we're married to but we still use the same word to talk about this kind of love but there are four Greek words I want to kind of unpack with you real quick that's interpreted love the first one is arios physical or sensual love where we get the English word erotic it's the first level of love. It's certainly often uh, pervasive in our culture and certainly was in, in uh, the biblical days that in, 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 in which Paul would find himself writing this letter uh, in this chapter on love. But he's sorting out the confusion between this love and lust. In every marriage, there ought to be arios love, but it shouldn't be the basis for any marriage. In a recent study by Dr. Helen Fisher, PhD in anthropology, revealed that physical, attraction, physical attractions began to wane in about three or four years. Three or four years. 
surely that's the reason that certainly Hollywood marriages don't last much more than five, if that long. It's built on Arios love. Arios seems to have a short shelf life. And then there's that word phileo. You're familiar with it. It's, it's friendship love. It's brotherly love. Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. Same word. It's a love that's evident when people have things in common. They have agreeable qualities. The love should be present in every marriage. In a, in a relationship between husband and wife, we ought to be good friends, amen? We ought to be connected in a way that socially, emotionally, and spiritually we've been knit together because there's this friendship love that connects us and makes us that way. It's the same way in the church. The love that we know, it's brotherly love. We're part of the family of God. And our expression one for another really can be identified in this, this great word of phileo love. Another word that's rarely used is storage. It's a unique love a parent has for their children. It is unique. It is special. Can I get an amen on that? It's the same kind of love that grandparents have for their grandchildren. Now can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, thought I'd get there with that. But Arios, Phileo, and even Storge is not what these scriptures are talking about being preeminent. The preeminent love you know well, and that is that Greek word agape. Divine love, unselfish love, unconditional love. Used over 300 times in the, in, in the New Testament. Interesting, it's not a common word used at all in classical Greek because the Greek culture knew nothing of this selfless, sacrificial love until Christianity showed up. This love prizes or puts great value on the person being loved. Do you understand that? Commentator Kenneth Wiest said it recognizes the worthiness of the object loved. It understands that this love is expressed because that person is valuable. It's not impulsive. It's not emotional. It's volitional. It's something you choose to do. It's an act of the will. The Christian counselor Gary Smalley, many of you remember him, he wrote that book, Love is a Decision. And he says agape is the quality and the nature of one doing the loving. It doesn't depend on the worthiness of the person being loved. It's not based on physical beauty, not qualified by what you've done for me lately. It is selfless love. Erwin Lutzer, the former pastor of Moody Church in Chicago, tells about preaching in the Midwest. He said a woman came to him with a little girl by her side and the woman had a cast on her arm and, arm and some scars on the side of her face as she had been in the hospital. She said, I've been in the hospital because I've been in a serious fire that burned over two-thirds of my body. She said, my husband walked into the hospital room, took one look at me and said, you're not the woman I married. And he left her to marry someone younger and more physically attractive. You see, that's human love. It says, as long as you look good enough for me, as long as you stimulate me, as long as I'm proud of you, as long as you're thin and attractive, I can love you, but if anything changes, my love will leave. It will change. So Paul is writing here about an unchanging love not based on physical beauty, not on benefits, but valuing the person who is being loved. Can I tell you, this agape is divine love. It lo this love comes from the throne room of God. 1 John 4, 7, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God, and he knows God because it comes from God. It's divine. Secondly, it's a descriptive love. 1 John 4, 8, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. Now understand, love doesn't define God. God defines love. And the way we are prescribed uh, to, uh, to understand as knowing God is that he is a God who loves us. And he is a, it describes his, his attribute in loving us. It's a delivering love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That great love 
delivers us from our sin. First, I mean, Colossians 1.13, For he has delivered us from the kingdom of darkness, and he has transferred us and translated us in the kingdom of his dear son. It's a delivering love, but it's a definitive love as well. Because if we want to just sum up the Christian life and use one word, we can get it down to this simple. It is about love. What did Jesus say in John 13? After the upper room, going, uh, what was going on there and, 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 and taking the Lord's Supper there and washing the disciples' feet, he says, A new commandment I give unto you that you love one another as I have loved you and by this shall men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. If love is that critical and that fundamental, we need to investigate what are its traits, what are the qualities of this agape, godlike love, which brings me to a second point, not only the preeminence, but now let's talk about the practice of love. Because the second paragraph defines what love is and what it's not. The first three verses actually focus on the emptiness produced when love is absent. And here the fullness of love is described. So let's look at how we can implement this practice of love. First he says it's got two positive traits. It's patient and it's kind. It's patient. Interesting word in the Greek New Testament. Macrothemeo. Macro meaning large or big. Themeo meaning suffering. It is, our God is long suffering. That's what patience is. He's slow to anger. It's a godlike quality. God is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but he's long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. God help us to love in a patient way because that's what he says. This is what love is. Love is patient. And then he says love is kind. It's a present tense verb, continuous action. In other words, we're not just to be kind. We're to be kind ongoingly in our life. Ephesians 4.32, and be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as Christ has forgiven you. Someone has said that kindness is the ability to love someone more than they deserve it. And these two words are used of God telling us about his wonderful attributes of patience and kindness. Do you realize in Romans 2.4, it says it's the kindness of God that leads men to repentance. Not his judgment, not his wrath, not his justice, but his kindness. When God visits our life in his great kindness, based in the love that he has for us, it moves us to turn from sin and turn and believe in him. God, too, is patient. The fruit of the Spirit, when we're walking with God, what is it? It's love first, and then it's joy, and it's peace, and it's patience. So be patient. That's part of what loving people are about. Be patient with them. I, I would tell you, it, it really is the golden rule for others how to treat them. You want other people to be patient with you, don't you? Come on. Sure you do. How about us being patient with them and see if that doesn't come back to us as well. If we want to have these kind of traits, we've got to walk in the spirit, patience and kindness. And then he says, it doesn't boast. It's not puffed up. It means love doesn't talk conceitedly. It's not, it's not pompous. It's not arrogant. Listen, is there anything more obnoxious than being around somebody that's always bragging on themselves? Telling us how great they are, what they've done, where they've been. I tell you, it wore Jesus out in his day. The Pharisees were champions at that because they loved to boast about their piety. They were condescending to others like the tax collectors. And here's what Jesus said about them in Matthew 6. Don't be like them. They love to be seen by men. That's the reason they're praying on the street corners. That's the reason they're sounding the trumpets when they give their alms. That's the reason they're disfiguring their faces when they're fasting because they love to be seen and recognized for their religious practices. Jeremiah the prophet said, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, nor the mighty man boast in his might, nor the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts glory in the Lord, that he 
exercises loving kindness and judgment and righteousness in the earth, for it's in these things I delight, says the Lord. And then he says it's not proud. Love's not proud. It's not arrogant. It's almost a synonymous thing. Pride is when there's a groundswell of, uh, of self-importance about our abilities, about our achievements. It's the sin of the big eye. It was Lucifer's sin. It was Eve's sin. It's a condition that makes everybody sick except the person who has it. And he keeps on with it. He's wrapped up in himself. Let me tell you, the person who's so wrapped up in himself is usually a pretty small package. Amen? He's not rude, it says. He doesn't, become, he doesn't act unbecomingly. There's a King James phrase for you. But it really is saying this person's acting in love's not rude. Why is love not rude? Well, obviously because it's kind. Actually, the principle has to do with, with poor manners here. Poor manners. Isn't it refreshing when you see some kids that are saying, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am? I'm telling you, it's been lost somewhere along the way. Someone who is, is unbecoming, who has poor manners. That's what it's saying. That person who's insensitive to other people. They're callous, they're obnoxious, they're overbearing, they're crude, they're rude. I, I would just say a rude Christian is an oxymoron. Well, love is more than being gracious and considerate. Can I tell you, it's never less than that. You want to repel people, just treat them with disrespect and arrogance. It's the reason the Bible speaks clearly in Philippians 2. You've got to esteem others better than yourself. Quit worrying about your own thing, but, but notice and begin to look at the things of other people. Don't be rude. Don't be proud. And he says it's not self-seeking. Love's not selfish. The key to understanding this agape love is because the root of all of mankind is always this. We desire to have our own way. I've learned this. Most people are easy to get along with, follow me now, if they get their way every time. You want your kids not to kick back with what you're wanting them to do? Just give them what they want. Pretty easy to parent if you don't have any rules. You just give them everything they want. They're pretty happy. Isn't that right, David? Pretty much. Bible commentator R.H. Linsky he said, if we were to cure selfishness, we, had, we have just replanted the Garden of Eden. But love is not preoccupied with having its own way. Christianity is a not what's in it for me religion. It's about honoring others. It's about esteeming others. It's about giving preference one to another. But hear me today, we have a default position and it's called selfishness. And if you and I aren't consciously living our lives not being selfish, we'll default and we will be selfish. We can't help ourselves because we get in the flesh. And when you and I get in the flesh, we will be selfish people. Next, it's not easily angered. It's not provoked because love is patient. Love doesn't get angry with other people for what they do or say because they're saying things we don't like. Love isn't retaliatory, it's forgiving. It's long-suffering. I, I, as I was working on this, I thought about that proverb out of 1911. It says, if it's, it's of a man's virtue to overlook a fault. <laughs> you know, sometimes you just got to overlook some things. It's not your position to straighten everybody out. I'll take care of that for you. <laughs> no, only kidding, only kidding. <laughs> And finally, it thinks no evil. I, I love what the NIV says here. It keeps no records of wrongs. This is actually an accounting term. As someone would write upon a ledger and, and documenting a checklist of things about a person so someday they can cash those things in. You follow me? If you're thinking evil then you're going to write it down so you can use it for against them at some point in time. But you know what forgiveness does? It, literally, this word 
forgiveness means to cancel the debt. So when people owe us something because of something that has happened to them, maybe we caused it, maybe we didn't, but they've taken up fault against us. The right way to respond in forgiving someone is not uh, skin for skin. It's not getting together and say, hey, you, you did this wrong and here's the reason I'm upset. It's canceling the debt. Yeah, they owe me something, but I don't care. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to push paid in full because that's what love does. Listen, the statute on limitations of offenses needs to expire immediately and that's what God's word is teaching here. The expiration date for citing someone else's wrongs was yesterday because forgiveness cancels the debt. And then finally, it does not rejoice in wrongdoing. God's love doesn't rejoice on other people's failures, their calamities, the sin that causes their demise. I mean... Have you ever been around somebody that maybe somebody in the church or someone had a moral failure and, and the person really just can't wait to tell it, you know? Listen, what happened to so-and-so? Some kind of perverse delight and, and, and simply just listen to what they did. That's not what love does at all. Oh, they may give it a little bit of an outward expression of, oh, that's too bad or something, but they're, they're reveling in telling the story. Can I tell you, it shames all of us when a brother or a sister in Christ falls into sin. And I, the only thing I can conclude is the reason that people have that attitude because they feel a little better about themselves, you know? Somebody else did something bad. I'm a little better than that. Maybe they're not. But it does rejoice in truth. Do not rejoice in others' wrongdoing. I'm quitting with this. We're going to be out here on plenty of time. The last point is this. Permanency of love. The permanency of love. Verses 7 8. Because it says love never fails. That's pretty permanent. The longevity of love never ends. Where there's prophecies, they will cease. Where there's tongues, they will be stilled. Where there's knowledge, it will pass away. And now these three will remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of all of those are love. Can I tell you, love never fails because Jesus never fails. And the profile of love is the portrait of our Savior. Greater love has no man than this, that he would lay down his life for his friends. But God demonstrated his love for us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And through eternity, know this, love will never fail. It's going to last for all eternity. Our salvation was driven, accomplished by the great love of God. And out of love comes his forgiveness, his mercy, his grace, his compassion, and his kindness to us. It's over the umbrella of love. He loves you today. He's got a great condescending love that has come after you to redeem you, to call you out of darkness and establish your ways, make a difference in your life. I tell you, he'll forgive you, sinner friend. He'll pour out his mercy and grace upon you because he loves you and he has a plan for your life. He's got purpose for you that only he can give if you'll turn from sin and turn to him and go God's way. Would you bow your heads with me today? So we always do, we conclude with a time of public invitation and let's all just breathe the same prayer. God, help us to love better. Help us to be willing to be loving and patient and kind. Not to be finding fault with others, putting into practice the difference that you're making in our life. God, I would pray that if 
our love has been a little short-sighted or misplaced or not used at all, God, forgive us. Help us to be better. Help us to realize it's, it's not easy going God's way, but it's the best way. So help us to say no to temptation and yes to you. Help us to be a better version of ourselves tomorrow. Help us to trend upward. Help our love to be greater than it's been. And I pray for any of them here that know you're not in the free pardon of sin, that they would come to grips with the reality that your love will capture their heart, put them on a new course. They'll never be able to do on their own. And your grace is sufficient. Your mercy is enough. So, Lord, as we sing this hymn of invitation, I pray that if there's any here that would like to make public decisions, I pray that they would. I pray for everyone that's heard this sermon today. I pray we'll leave a little more edified than when we come. And that we have a greater desire to be more like our Savior. We pray in His precious name. Amen. Let's stand together. David's going to lead us. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. If you'd like to come, that'd be great. We'd love to have you.